All right, that's your time. That is your time. Let me remind you that with very little time left between now and the end of the school year, I will be here after school until 5, 5.30. Uh, come with your period eight confusions. Come with your concerns. Come with all those things. I'm happy to walk them through. We'll do what I told you last week. We'll do a timeline over here with the domestic developments. Modern Republicanism, I, uh, all, all the, the Truman stuff, to, uh, today Kennedy and LBJ stuff. Uh, and then below, we'll do the foreign developments. You can see kind of side by side what's happening overseas and domestically in the uh, period eight post-World War II world. Uh, our next boot camp is Saturday. I'm waiting for confirmation that I can have boot camp. <laughs> my, 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 I haven't asked anybody. I'm just waiting for, I'm waiting to be told, told no. It's a good philosophy in life. I, I follow it often. It's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Like, just do it, and then say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Instead of asking permission and being told no ahead of time. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mom, I didn't know I couldn't go out last night. All right. Uh, so, as of now, Saturday's on. Uh, we are diving in on some some legit essay prompts and student samples and scoring them, and then you're going to have a chance to write, to look at some documents, but it'll be very interactive and, and collaborative. Um, quick show of hands, who's planning to come on Saturday so that I can make sure y'all have donuts? Y'all wild. I, everybody except uh, Arielli because she's too cool for us. Fine. Your church school? So Jesus is more important than anybody? Well, you're, uh, you're action safe. You're know? telling me that God is more important than Rachel. <laughs> your parents me? You're telling me your parents are more important than me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> You're right. Fine. So, uh, but yes, God is very important. Well done. Today, we're talking about, in my opinion, and as you guys know, I have a lot of opinions. In my opinion, the greatest array, I'll put it here on the notes for you, the greatest array of liberal legislation ever. Ever. All right. Greater than Reconstruction, greater than the New Deal, greater than, than the Progressive Era. And when I say liberal legislation, what does that mean to you guys? When I say liberal legislation, what does that mean? Don't all laws affect society? The, okay, but benefit is an opinion question. Right? Like, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you, but saying that passing laws that benefit society, that is our opinion and therefore not a historical fact. Which you're on the right track. Daniel, help him out. Legislation that helps push progress. That's a little better. That's a little better. Liberal legislation argues that what is the solution to the problem? What's the solution? Government. Government. Right? Like using the power of the government to solve problems is how you solve problems. Right? Whereas conservative legislation argues that less government is good. Right? The government's, uh, like Jefferson says, he that governs best governs least. Right? The smaller government, the better. So liberal legislation, uh, if we're going to go back in time, liberal, we can also add loose interpretation. Liberal loose, liberal loose, way back to like Federalist times. Using the power of the government to solve problems, whether it be to make a bank. Whether it be to uh, regulate commerce, whether it be to end slavery, whether it be to uh, inspect some meat, whether it be to uh, create the civilian conservation, all those things are saying that we're going to use the government's power to change things. So tell me real quick, what are some of the successes of the civil rights movement pre-1960? Felix, give me something. Um, Louder, Felix. Brown versus the Board of Education. Brown versus the Board of Education. Felix, why is that important? Good. It unsegregated or desegregated. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, it desegregated schools. Brown versus Board in 1954 is a very, very big deal. Justin, go ahead. The Double V campaign. Double V campaign. Sure. What do they get done? They desegregate the military and the federal. Eventually. What do they do shorter term? Desegregate the during the war. World War II has a desegregated military? Yes, uh, the armed forces industries. Okay. Okay, cool, cool. 
Uh, then you can add, if you wanted to, what you just said to Truman, and desegregating the military and the federal government. That's important. I like it. I like it. Uh, what about the Montgomery bus boycott? Success or not success? Yeah, yeah. yeah right? Let's put Montgomery bus up here. Let's go. So, why? Why are all of these things successes? What caused these successes? This is the important part of the question. Identifying like some successes is is small. Why? What caused these? Mr. Lopez, help me out here. What if, what causes these successes, sir? Well, all of them they're like uh, peaceful. Ah, all right. Peaceful protest. Protest. Do any of these successes come because the government's like, you know what we should do? We should help out black people. No, no. No. Right? Does, does Truman wake up one day and think, man, you know what? I'll, I had a dream. I had a dream that we should probably desegregate the army. Does that happen? No. Does FDR willingly desegregate the armed forces industry during World War II? Mm -hmm. No. Right? All of these, the thing I want to stress to you guys is the why, which is super important for any sort of social change, is that, that these things are forced by the black community. Right, whether it be forced through the school, the court system regarding schools with Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP, whether it be forced with protest and boycotts with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, in Montgomery, right, whether it be forced uh, with A. Philip Randolph and the March on Washington by saying, you're telling the whole world we're fighting for freedom, but you got 100,000 black people that are willing to, to march right now in Washington, D.C. saying we don't even have freedom at home. So the thing I want to stress to you guys, which is super important for all social change, is that it comes not by, by the government entity giving away rights, but it comes by people that want more, demanding more out of their government. And that's what matters the most. So today we're talking about Kennedy and LBJ's America, domestically only. Monday, we'll spend our entire time talking about their foreign policies, which uh, are a disaster. Monday, we'll talk about the Bay of Pigs, Monday we'll talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we'll spend 85% of money talking about the, the dumpster fire that is Vietnam. Right. So today, the three main foci are the Great Society, the Civil Rights Movements, and then with it, these revolutions that are happening domestically in uh, America regarding like who is a citizen and what the government should do to protect us. Any questions before we begin? Good. We feel it's a good prompt. It's a very college boarding type prompt. But I would not be surprised to see like an LEQ uh, on your test and may read it for us, buddy. Beautiful. Have you seen a prompt kind of similar to that before? <coughs> Wait, you're right, buddy? Dine on me? Man. Uh, have you seen a prompt similar to this? For what? The new the DBQ, yes. And also remember your thesis quiz last week? There was a lot of extent to which the New Deal changed the role of the federal government. Hint, hint. You're writing your first in-class LEQ next Wednesday? It might have something to do with combining those two prompts. Maybe comparing the New Deal and the Great Society in a way that I think you'd be very, very, very good at because you're good. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just getting all just making things up. And or the prompt's already written and copied by the folks. So I have a cartoon because we always had to start with a cartoon. It's a good one. Take a minute with your partner. What is, it, what is the... the the context, the background for this particular cartoon. What is this cartoon's intended audience? Who is this trying to reach? And what is the point of view or the perspective of this particular cartoon? One minute uh, with your partner. Please discuss it at length now. Go. Come on. Yes, he's plowing dirt. This is short. That's a No, no, the horse, it's a race horse. What do race horses do? They go fast, right? And the horse says forced progress. Yeah, we want to go faster, right? But is this cartoon arguing that's a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, it's a good cartoon. I like this one. 
<laughs> All right, we stop you guys there. So I know, I know that we probably don't know a lot of things about horses. Wow. They have four legs. Good. Good. Sometimes five. You think about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, horses, but there's a lot of different kinds of horses. <laughs> a lot of different kinds of horses. And in this cartoon, we have two different kinds of horses. Uh, what kind of horse is this? It's a race horse. What do race horses do? Fast. Go fast. Yeah, right? Does this horse look fast? Nah. How does this horse look? It looks wide and bulky. It looks kind of like the, it's got the build like Nieto. Right? Yeah. Ready to plow? <laughs> My man. Oh, uh, right. This is called a plow horse. Yeah. Right? And they work on farms, right? They're slow. They're steady. They, they drag farm equipment, right? You can rely on them. Race horses go fast, but they usually die young. <coughs> Plow horses are going to live for a long time. They're going to get up every day. They're going to go slowly. They're going to go slowly. They're going to go slowly, but they're going to get the job done. So what is on this horse? What does that say? You guys can you see horse it? Progress. Horse progress. Okay. Horse progress. And on this, what does this one say? Gradualism. Gradualism. All right, what does gradualism mean to you guys? Like slowly. Slow, steady. All right. Slow, steady, what? Delivery. Slow, steady, progress. Oh. <laughs> but yes, yes. Uh, you guys are all using the, the, the tortoise and the hare story. Uh, slow and steady wins the race. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and what are we plowing? What is the south, according to this cartoon, what is the south plow? Race, race relations. Right? We're slowly making our progress on race relations. Find this nice slow horse. And here comes homeboy. How is he dressed? Yeah, into the college college graduation gown, doesn't it? Yeah. All right, so we can assume that's like a little bit of a slight or an insult to like the northern educated elites who are coming to the south to tell the south what to do. He's got a, he's got this little college, you know. And this guy's like, I'm just a freaking worker down here. All right, here come these northerners who are screaming, "You're not going fast enough. You're not going fast enough. Try this one." And when, when he says this one, what does he mean? I right, tried this racehorse that's going to go faster, right? Forced progress. Interesting. I'm going to give you a good like synthesis point here. This accusation is very similar to the carpetbaggers from Reconstruction. These northerners that are moving south, that are that are demanding oh. change, that are yeah. I don't know. The six of you just from Reconstruction are like nodding along in the line, but the rest of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, the people that are moving from the north to the south to try to profit off of Reconstruction. So, um, but the cap, the caption tells us everything. You're about to read the caption for us. This is no job for a racehorse. So, would you argue this cartoon comes from a southern or a northern perspective? Southern. Southern, right? They're saying, "Hey, we're down here getting our progress slowly, and here you guys are coming, demanding that we need to go faster." But this is not the kind of job that we should that should be done quick. So for context, we can talk about southern resistance to school integration. Uh, for context, we can talk about Brown versus Board of Education. Good. Bless you. And yet the South is saying, you can't make us speed up. We're going to do this at our own pace. Our own pace. I like this cartoon. You guys like this cartoon? Yeah. It's pretty good, huh? We're going to talk about horses. It was a good day. <laughs> period 8 cartoons. Hopefully, are there any period 8 cartoons on the top today? Yes. You'll see one tomorrow, Monday. The Vietnam train. What grade is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good question. So, my point is like I told you in class yesterday, that just passing laws, does that make the South change? Does that make America change? No. 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 Does, does, does do Supreme Court cases and racism? No. No. All right. So we're, we're trying to make schools change. We're trying to end segregation, but there's still a ton of resistance. And on that note, I want to show you one of the most fantastic speeches in American history from my boy 
short ball. Moving, that makes it less of an angle. All right, you guys ready? Yes, sir. So I'm going to pause this right when it starts. I'm going to. Every time I put a clip on, you guys can't just control yourselves for 10 seconds. No. I want you to listen to this introduction, and then I'm going to pause it, and we're talking about it. Ready? Today, I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood. Today, I have stood where Jefferson Davis once stood. Who's Jefferson Davis? The president of the Confederacy. The president of the Confederacy. Okay, okay. Well, right, good start. Good start. It's right over you guys. Today, I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood. I took an oath to my people. It is now appropriate that from this cradle of the Confederacy, this very heart of the great Anglo Saxon Southland, that today we sound the drum for freedom as they are our generation of full men who put us young time and again down through history. What is he already? Thirty seconds in. What is, he, what is he reference? Turn to your partner. What are some of the things he's he's, he's used to ground his speech? Thirty seconds in. What? Apparently, there's some people that have a hard time hearing it. Let me try it again. <laughs> Listen. Listen. Today, I have stood where once Jefferson Davis stood and took an oath to my people. It is now appropriate that from this cradle of the Confederacy, this fair part of the great Anglo Saxon Southland, where is he speaking from? The heart of the Anglo-Saxon. The cradle of the Confederacy and the heart of the Anglo-Saxon heartland. Okay, okay. Now, okay, now we got that. Good, I got something that I go. Say that through two times. All right. Uh, is he hiding his intentions here? No. 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 Definitely not. Definitely not. Where is he? That's a day we found the drum of freedom and held our generation of poor guys who us done time and again down through history. now 120 times and every time it makes me feel ill like I want to laugh but I'm also like holy shit <laughs> segregation forever a hundred years after we've, we've ended slavery and he said and who's he blaming for, for bringing these problems to the south the tyranny of the federal government which sounds just like the arguments that southern slaveholders had when Northern is trying to abolish slavery, right? It's this oppressive federal government's coming down here to the South to tell us what to do. I draw a line in the sand, and I throw a gauntlet at the feet of liberty, and I say, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And now you understand why, like, that little clip at the end of yesterday with Eisenhower, sending the military to force integration of schools, like, why that's necessary. Keep in mind, this is George Wallace, who I showed you on the 1956 election map, ran for president and won four states in the South. So it's not like he's some obscure dude. He's the governor of Alabama. So regardless, by the end of the 1950s, 
other than these things we've discussed. The 50s are a prosperous, optimistic time. By the end of the decade, Americans are more optimistic. Americans are a little bit happier. Americans are definitely more well-off financially. Americans are no longer afraid of the Great Depression. Right? We've gotten far enough away without uh, crumbling back into depression. The anxiety over the Cold War has subsided some as things have cooled off during Eisenhower's tenure because of brinksmanship and the fear other countries have of us. But coming into the 60s, the two things that are really of, of concern as we, talk, as we begin our 60s are American values, uh, what America really stands for, and race relations. Right? These two things are still significantly uh, influential issues that are kind of lurking beneath the surface of the 1950s prosperity and happiness. So 1960 comes, and we have, as we do every four years, a presidential election. In this case, we have two individuals uh, that are going to play a huge role for the rest of our school year. Uh, John F. Kennedy and Richard Milhouse Nixon. <coughs> Richard Milhouse Nixon. Uh, there they are. Kennedy, good looking. Uh, Nixon looks like a little bit like a, like, like, a, like a communist rat. I'm not quite sure. Um, and first, I want you to take a look at the map. All right, take 30 seconds with your partner. What does this election map reveal about the nature of politics in this election? Is this a, is this a, a, a blowout election? Is this a close election? What can we learn about politics and from this map? One minute, go. Go, 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 go. Right, draw some conclusions. What do you see? What's new? What's no person? Uh, uh, I stand before you. Well, Jefferson Davis All right. Uh, other candidate is, is most almost all George Wallace. Uh, God, who you just saw. Uh, no, we're not surprised. <laughs> uh, please tell me, Winfield, uh, what's the conclusion you can draw from this election map, sir? First of all, let me stop you there. Isn't it crazy we've been looking at election maps since 1800 with Jefferson and Adams? 1796, Jefferson and Adams, and here we are, like 1960. Right? I've been telling you the whole time, election maps always tell a story. Now you guys can kind of tell a story on your own, which makes me very happy. Go for it. Tell me your story, Winfield. It was close. It was close. Uh, he's such a man. He's such a wise man of a few words. Yeah, very close. Very, very close. Uh, is this a mandate election? No. No? Okay. Okay. Uh, keep in mind, where does a lot of, this is new, where does a lot of Nixon's, Nixon's votes come from? The South. The South. Interesting. Hasn't the South almost always been Democrat? Yes. Yeah. And now the South's voting Republican. Huh. Huh. I just think that's interesting. That's all. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. All right. All right. All right. Um, this, I want to stress to you guys in 1960, one of the most important pieces of this is it's the first real televised presidential election. Right? So, because TV's playing such a big role. Um, the first nationally televised debate happens between Nixon and Kennedy. Uh, and, and TV plays a huge role in this election because Kennedy looks better on TV than Nixon. <laughs> Kennedy's a good-looking man. Nixon is... A man. Not. Yes, Nixon is, is just a man. Thank you, Justin. Nixon's just a man. Um, those that listen to this very important debate, it's a very close election. Those that listen to the debate on the radio say Nixon won. But those that watch it on TV see a man who's nervous and sweaty and fidgety, and they watch it on TV and like, oh, that guy looks like a freaking mess. Mess. Look at that guy. So those that watch on TV think Kennedy wins because he's more cool and calm and collected. Those that listen on the radio think Nixon wins. And an election that's that close, that's like the types of little things that decide an election. So TV plays a huge role. Kennedy obviously looks better on television. He's calmer, he's more collected, he's more ready uh, to engage in the conversation. And thus, he wins the election. But I want to stress to you guys that it's not a mandate election. It's a very close election. So will Kennedy get to do whatever he wants as president with Congress support? No. No, right? Because he didn't have a huge electoral victory. So his domestic policy, his approach, his policy... As I told you after Teddy Roosevelt Square deal, every president had a name for the policy. Uh, Kennedy's is called New Frontier. The New Frontier. There it is. The Frontier. It's back. Wow. 
right? I told you, Frontier always plays a role in it. It's an idea of like undiscovered next. All right, the new frontier for him is overseas and is space. We're going to send a man to the moon. We're going to uh, make the world a better place. We're going to fix the environment. We're going to do all these things. Uh, he has a very famous line in his inaugural address, which I love the line. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. So he's asking for this spirit of servitude, this spirit of collectiveness, the spirit of us and we working together. It's quite uh, City on a Hill-esque, in a sense. Uh, and his, his famous speech says, in his inaugural same speech, we will go to the moon in this decade. Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And we will do the other hard things as well because the world deserves it. So, Kennedy's super excited, very optimistic. He, he brings this tone of, of optimism and satisfaction. A uh, couple important things that take place under his presidency that we'll get into all of them as we go. Socially and culturally, it's his presidency that really uh, launches what we consider the modern civil rights movement of the 1960s. Uh, it's his presidency that, that sees the beginnings of feminism, the second wave, new wave feminism, that we'll see in the 1960s and 1970s with a book that we'll, we'll read an extra of next in two classes called The Feminine Mystique. It's his presidency that launches the environmental movement. Uh, as Rachel Carson is going to publish a book called Silent Spring that's highlighting how much we're, we're poisoning our environment, and that's going to lead in the 60, late 60s and 70s to a profound uh, uh, attempt to fix our environmental issues. Uh, and his three big foreign developments, uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion, disaster as you guys read about, uh, the Berlin Wall, disaster as you guys read about, and the Cuban Missile Crisis as well. But I'll save those for Monday when we talk about foreign policy of the Cold War. Also under his presidency, we ratify the 23rd Amendment, that's cool, uh, which gives electoral votes, presidential votes, to Washington, D.C. People live there, they should have a say in their presidency. Not that important. Never been your AP test. I just think it's noteworthy. Because sometimes you guys come to class and I'll talk about the 24th Amendment next class. Or today, actually, at the end, and you're like, well, what was the 23rd Amendment? And I'll like, I forgot. Well, there it is. Now don't ask. Got it? All right. Good. So his new frontier, really, what he's promising is a return to FDR era liberal policy. So keep in mind the Democratic Party, really, this might tell you FDR's presidency is such a big turning point. Because FDR, who's the president after FDR? Truman. Who is the Democratic president after Truman? Eisenhower's Republic. Who's, so who's the next Democratic president? Kennedy. And both, both are, are promising a return to FDR-style liberal policies. Uh, big government, spending, and liberalism. Question for you all. Was Truman successful in getting these FDR-style liberal policies passed? No. Right? But this is my point about the Democratic Party and why FDR's presidency is such a big turning point. Because every president after is going to be like, I'm going to take us back to those kinds of policies and the government's here to solve problems. Big turning point. Especially for the Democrats that have traditionally been the party of smaller government. So he promises a return of FDR-era liberal policies of spending and support and social programs and this and the like. But, as we know, he does not have a mandate election. It's a very close election. So conservatives in Congress, conservatives in Congress, Southern and Northern conservatives, but Southern Democrats, Southern Republicans, Northern conservatives are going to oppose his social reforms. We're going to have some economic reforms. What I want to stress to you guys, though, is his big shortcoming is on social progress. And it's too bad because social progress is the place in which we need the most help. Right, economic progress is already happening because the 50s and prosperity and these things, but it's social progress that's the big problem, and it's social progress that gets pushed back on. He wants to fix education. He wants to fix health care, just like Truman did. And have a, a national health care type policy, uh, just like Truman tried to do. And both of those things are, are shut down by Congress. He tries to pass aid for public schools. And the, federal, and the, the conservatives say, no, that's a state issue. State should pay for that. The federal government gets canceled. He tries to extend Social Security, gets canceled. He tries to pass unemployment benefits for the lower classes, gets canceled. And he tries to create medical insurance for old people. Medical insurance for the elderly, like Social Security, but for health care. And that all, get, all four things get shot down by Congress. And I put shot down as a nice little, uh-huh, because so does he. Um, 
<laughs> Shot down backwards. However, we do see some economic changes. Congress does pass some legislation to help the poor, which is cool. We increase the minimum wage under Kennedy's presidency. That's cool. Take that. And we increase funds for public housing. For those who are having a hard time paying for their housing, we increase funding for public housing. But big picture, big picture, the economy is still booming. This is still the 1950s economy of, of prosperity, of spending, of consumerism, of industry production, of jobs. Our industries are, are modernizing very quickly, thanks largely to the military industrial complex and the space race and the arms race. The government is still spending a freak ton of money. And there's a huge tax cut in 63. So the economy is, is running very well. Jobs are created. We're being very prosperous. Being very prosperous. Now the group that's that's most resistant to F to J excuse me. To JFK's like slow progress is African American. Huh? African Americans, JFK keeps telling them like, we'll, "We'll get you guys. We'll get you guys. We'll get you guys," and that kind of like references the cartoon. Uh, we'll get there slowly. We'll get there slowly. And African Americans like, no, no. Like we waited. Uh, I don't know since 1619. The time is now. So African American leaders, civil rights leaders, are refusing to wait for the government to respond. If you wait for the government to respond, how long will you be waiting? Forever, right? It's like being on hold with Verizon. No way. Lasts forever. But like times like 100 years. Um, so one important group, a new, a new acronym for you, we had the NAACP yesterday, is CORE. CORE is very important to the Congress of Racial Equality. And if you remember, CORE is first founded during World War II. So again, that's my argument that a lot of social progress traces back to war. In this case, World War II creates CORE. Or excuse me, Corps created during World War II to advocate for black progress. Uh, and what they're going to do, and you're going to read a crazy excerpt in a minute that's going to make your, ugh, fat. Uh, they're going to lead what's called the Freedom Rides. And what this means is they're going to get on segregated buses and ride to the south from like Washington, D.C., from northern cities. These are college students. Right? They're going to ride to the south and they're going to stop at every bus station. <coughs> And they're going to go to the bathroom in the white bathroom. And they're going to sit in the white waiting room. And they're going to drink out of the white water fountain. To protest the fact that the Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal is not allowed. And yet the bus, the interstate bus system is still segregated. What do you think might be the reaction here from the white south? Yeah. All right. Anger, right? Uh, but what are they hoping to do in this protest? What's the goal here? What, what is their goal? Right? I'm talking about how all these other things are forced by, by activism. What's the goal of riding and segregated buses and saying, I'm not sitting in the black section? Take 10 seconds to talk to the next to you since you don't want to answer. What's the goal here? Go for it. Why? What's, what's the purpose of, the, uh, of going on these freedom rides? Wow. All right. Nunez, what's the goal, sir? Oh, uh, we talked about um, bringing like attention to segregation yeah. stuff. Yeah, bring attention, right? If the white South's gonna react badly, then guess what? Every American has in their living room now a TV, and then chances are that might show up on the TV, and then more people are uh, are aware of problems. Okay. Also, if they go to the South and they all get beat up, who, who looks bad? Uh, and the government for not protecting them. <laughs> also, activists you're going to see some pictures in a minute are going to try to break a ban on black enrollment at Ole Miss, which is the University of Mississippi, and the University of Alabama, the two biggest public universities in the Deep South, by arguing like after Brown versus Board, why can't we go to these schools? Because the Supreme Court says, and they're going to try really hard uh, to desegregate those universities as well. Cool. So the Freedom Rides look like this. 1961 is the year. They're going to start in Newark, New Jersey. These are all black college students that are going to risk their lives, get on buses, and go dare the South to do something about it. 
Some of them are going to go through Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. Whew. Where does that all want to go? Uh, and then D.C., West Virginia, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi as well. Both are ugly. So go ahead and take four minutes. I'll give you three minutes. Uh, this is one of the, the directors the, the, who created, he works for CORE, Color and Racial Equality. Name's James Farmer. Big name, awesome name, good dude, uh, very influential. And he's going to talk to you about the planning for this. And then kind of what happens as they, as they move south. Okay? He's going to be on this ride right here. If it helps you guys at all. Starting in D.C., going through Virginia, going through North Carolina, going through South Carolina, going through Georgia and Florida. Just a quick guess. Which state do you think will give them the biggest problem? Alabama. South Carolina. Isn't that always the answer? Come on now. <laughs> Take three minutes, please. Read it and answer my three questions. Three minutes, go. Ninety seconds left. Good text. Breaks it all down for you. I'm going to bump it out an extra minute because I'll make sure you guys finish this one. Most 
of you are done or done-ish, I want you to turn to the person next to you. I want you to answer the third question, just verbally as fine. How did, how did their reaction to their protest evolve as they moved deeper into the South, right? How is the way they're treated and responded to change as they get farther into the South? Take a minute to talk about that quickly, go. One minute. I know. Oh my God is right. Yes. Which part? South Carolina. We have a Supreme Court ruling. He says, "Shit on that." What was that? He said it. Sorry, these look more like a white spot. Okay. Well, guys, talk it out. Talk it out. How did, how, what is your reaction? What is your response? What happens here? Right. Talk to me, please, Mr. Rubicon. What happens here? <clears throat> well, when I well, like the first question, like the bold, I think that they were like on fire. And yeah. I know where their goal was to bring awareness to segregation, and then they prepared by it by having like roles. Yeah. By practicing. Yeah. And then they were they knew the consequences, and then of course they said that they were prepared for any, anything, even death, and that was. It's, it's kind of crazy to think about, right? That they're, they're willing to, to be physically harmed to the point of death. And go to, do they want to go to jail and get out of jail? No. no fill the jail. Right, he referenced Gandhi. Gandhi, yes. Cool. And then how are they treated? Yes? Nothing. What do the police do? Uh, intervene. Uh, who's the guy? What's the guy's name that gets zappy? John Lewis. Remember that name? Because John Lewis currently, in 2020, is a member of the House of Representatives. Oh, wow. For, that's my point. It's not that long ago. From the House of Representatives, uh, representing a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia, and he's been in the House of Representatives for the last 20 years. He's in, in his early 80s. He's one of the chief individuals who's been accusatory of Donald Trump since day one of his presidency, and he is the one who got his ass beat on the Freedom Rides. My point is that, like, progress is possible. He goes from this to serving in the House of Representatives. Thurgood Marshall goes from arguing against school segregation to being the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. John Lewis will also be the individual who gets attacked brutally, almost to the point of death, on the Selma Bridge for the March to Selma, when they get attacked by the uh, white cops in Alabama. Uh, so John Lewis has quite the career. And John Lewis is now in Congress serving as a representative of the government. It's kind of a cool story. Check the page. So that's the guy who set the whole thing up. This guy, Hank Thomas, he, he goes, I believe, the Alabama route. So he's going to be on this this freedom ride to Alabama. All right. So we had South Carolina with trouble. He's going to go to Alabama. It's a short one. Take two minutes, please. Just tell me what, what most shocked, you, what most surprised this guy from his experience riding the bus to Alabama. Two minutes go. <coughs> two minutes, read.
<laughs> you keep asking me questions like I'm not gonna. <laughs> What most surprised this guy from his experience? Go, go. Uh, first of all, uh, the doctor, the doctor, yes. Like the doctors were like, no and right riders outside, and like, okay, you guys know. Yeah, right there. Yeah, good luck. Right? Yeah, just the rest of your bus ride. Enjoy your stand. Beautiful state of Alabama. Yeah. All right. Let me stop you there, please. All right, Sully. What most surprised this dude? The hospital was like, man, that's crazy. Good luck out there. All right. Is he surprised that the bus gets bombed? No. Not really, right? Is he surprised that he gets beat up? No. But his surprise is. I, He's like, you guys are, are, are health, uh, you guys are healthcare workers. Your job is to help people that need help. And here I am, and here we all are, smoke inhalation, cut, bruised, bleeding. And you're like, man, crazy story. Good luck out there. And the white mob is not content to just send them to the hospital. They're outside the hospital protesting because black people are riding a bus. Like, zoom out for a second and then think about it. Is this hurting anybody? No. No. Is this taking away white people's ability to ride a bus? No. No. Just like voting. Is black people voting taking away white people's power to vote? No. No. A bus. Very famous picture of the Freedom Rides right here as they're all trying to get off the bus. As you can see, the bus is on fire, about to explode. It's not just this. But here's University of Alabama students who are burning their notice that says they have to be segregated. Turn the light off so you can All see right. it a little better. What do you see in the picture? Confederate flags and angry white people. All right, as they're burning it. All right, I told you guys in class, like, don't be one of these people in the back of these pictures. Right. And then George Wallace also, then he's back. He's back. Uh, the University of Alabama is forced to integrate, and he says, I will stand at the door of the school and not allow any black students in myself. Just like Orville Fathers did in Arkansas, we saw yesterday, uh, for a high school, but now it is for a university. Now it is for a university. Uh, I'll show you the integrated clip, I guess. It's only a minute long. You ready? Yeah. yeah. All right. August 11th, 1963, news cameras at the University of Alabama, where the governor of the state, just like Orville Bobbis in Arkansas, tries to block integration by standing in the door of the school. How'd that work out for Arkansas? Uh, Not good. Not good. And which president forced integration in Arkansas? Uh, uh, Eisenhower. Which party? Republican. All right, so now we have who's president in 63? What he points out, first thing he says, is when the TV started showing these things to people in their homes, people had different reactions. So I want to stress to you the influence the TV has on the civil rights movement. Because we can like spread these images, but people can't really avoid them anymore. Very similar ah. Ah. <coughs> to abolitionist literature in the North, like Uncle Tom's Cabin. Right? When that becomes a best-selling book, it's harder to ignore slavery. Here, instead of a book, it's television, as Americans are getting dumber and reading less, but here it is, part of that definition, so they can see. But it's the same, same idea that it becomes harder to ignore the problem when it's beamed into your freaking living room. Whether that be with a book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, or the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, or TV. Continuity and change over time. <laughs> Burning the crop. Actually, people will actually go ahead, different reactions. 
George Wallace, who blocked the integration of the state university by literally standing in the door. I stand here today as governor of this sovereign state and refuse to willingly submit to the illegal usurpation of power by the central government. President Kennedy was forced to federalize National Guard troops to remove Wallace. Civil rights leaders were pleased to see the president finally use the bully pulpit for their cause. But they have a right to expect that the law will be fair. On June 12th, the Wallace Kennedy confrontation was front page news. And as you can see how it ends, it, it works. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, 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 the newspaper, sorry. There you go. Wallace begins pulling troopers, Negroes in class. So again, this is shown in the same pattern of a state resisting. The president being like, you can't just resist federal law and then using the force of the federal government to force southern states to integrate their schools. Right, so now we got a check for Eisenhower on high schools. We got a check for Kennedy on universities. We are making some progress. Is this enough? No. 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 George Wallace is, as we see, one of the more fascinating characters. Uh, in the U.S. history. Uh, there he is. Sorry, his freaking suit doesn't even fit right. Alright, looks something like Alvarez. Uh, yeah. Where did I lie? Uh, here we have, let's say, now the first black students going to the University of Alabama. Big, big deal. We'll take that. Uh, it's, it's groundbreaking. That black students are willing to subject themselves to this type of treatment to be the first. Right? To, to pave the way for then students like you to go to universities and not even think twice about them. So again, still not enough. All right, JFK has finally done something on civil rights, but it's not sufficient. Now, MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., is going to actually force JFK to openly support civil rights by saying, like, if you don't, then I'll just gonna make things uglier for you. And JFK is like, yeah, just wait, hold on. Wait for my second term. No. Uh, and he's gonna do this at the Birmingham March. Right, Birmingham, Alabama, all these black voters are going to be marching for civil rights. They use Birmingham on purpose, on purpose, because of who's in charge of the police there. It's a man named Bull Connor. Oh, wow. Police commissioner named Bull Connor, and they know he's going to use violence, and they know he's going to be aggressive, and they know that will cause the news to cover it, and they know that will change Americans' opinion. So they march day after day. They're arrested in the Atlanta jail. They're arrested in the Atlanta jail. They're, they're arrested in the Atlanta jail. Eventually, the violence comes, and like they like they want, public opinion is like, oh my god, I can't believe that happened. Uh, MLK is put in jail. They use brutal force to end the protest, police force, and it's this police brutality. It's this this visual of seeing the police dogs attacking people and fire hoses. Uh, knocking people off their feet and police hitting people with clubs, that begins to change public opinion. And once public opinion changes, JFK starts to turn his, change his tune and start the process of a new civil rights bill. So they go to Bur and Birmingham's not the first city they go to. They go to a different city in Alabama first and they protest all day and they're not arrested, they're not treated brutally, and they're like, oh, I'm gonna try another city then because they're treated humanely, because they're put in jail peacefully, then they're let out of jail. And they're put back in jail, let out of jail, and it goes on and on. Birmingham, however, is a big turning point because of the violence that's used against them. I have some pictures for you guys that shows what I'm talking about. The fire hose, though. Very famous picture. Or even the Southern Dogs are racist. Yeah, just but just letting him. That fool's like, damn, bro. <laughs> That's why I'm back now. <laughs> uh, and it is Birmingham. It is Birmingham that gives MLK's incredibly famous letter from a Birmingham jail, uh, which kind of becomes the foundation of the rest of the civil rights movement. 
uh, of nonviolent protest. Uh, it's, it's here in which he argues that the biggest barrier, I like this a lot, my favorite line, it's a very under, under, underused line. The biggest barrier to black progress is not the white racist. The biggest barrier to black progress is the white moderate. Who's like, yeah, it's bad. Like, he's basically calling out JFK. And they're like, I'll get to it eventually. Uh, the biggest problem, he's like, we're not going to fix the white racists, but those middle people, the moderates, who are like, maybe go a little slower, that's the biggest barrier to black progress. The letter from Brigham Jail is incredibly monumental. Uh, it's a key document in A-Push in which he articulates the entire nonviolent vision of protest, 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 but allow them to commit the violence and then us to reap the rewards. It is out of this movement that comes the March on Washington, the very, 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 very famous March on Washington. Once JFK is let, excuse me, once MLK is let out of jail, the four main civil rights organizations that are all kind of competing with each other for influence, it's important that they come together here as under one tent. The core, we already talked about, the Congress of Racial Equality. The SCLC is MLK's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Right, so using the black church to argue for change. Uh, the NAACP, we've already talked about. We're talking about. And SNCC, you read about. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The students. Freedom Rides, etc. All right, so the ones who do the sit-in movements at lunch counters and the like. The ones that are arguing for school integration. So all four groups, right? A general group, a religion-based group, a legal-based group for, for the four cases, and the student group are all going to come together to organize a march on Washington. Again, their demand is a new Civil Rights Act. They want new laws put on the books guaranteeing civil rights. 200,000 protesters show up from all races. Black protesters, white protesters, Latinx protesters, immigrant protesters, men, women, and they're going to fill the entire area. Have you ever seen a picture of Washington, D.C. where like the president's inaugural address is? Like across the whole, it's called the Mall, big, huge, open grass area that goes about a mile and a half from the Lincoln Monument to the uh, Capitol building. They're going to fill the whole thing with 200,000 people. A lot of people. Right? Uh, it's here where MLK gives his incredibly famous I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that one day my children will be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Uh, and it is this show of force. Right, that is incredibly peaceful and nonviolent, but also aggressive in its numbers and its, its, its volume that has the Kennedy administration respond by starting to lay the framework out for a Civil Rights Act. Check us out. All right, so those two things, the Birmingham March and the violence there, combined with I Have a Dream. So Americans are given this juxtaposition of, of black protesters and violence. And then again, black protesters and the I Have a Dream speech, which is just arguing for equality. It really helps sway public opinion towards the black cause, towards more civil rights. So it's here, finally, in 63, three years into his presidency, that Kennedy lays out the framework or the foundation for what becomes the Civil Rights Act. And then he dies. Then he dies. Right. Uh, a short while later, He's in Dallas, in Texas. Uh, he is assassinated, and his vice president, Lyndon Bain Johnson, becomes president. Now, OBJ is going to use his death as a catapult. What do catapults do? They launch things, right? LBJ uh, is a southerner. LBJ is from Texas. LBJ is, early in his career, kind of conservative on race. Kind of conservative on race. He's liberal on social programs and spending. His idol is FDR. His idol is Roosevelt. He goes up during the New Deal. He sees the power of the federal government helping his family. So he's very, don't get this confused, he's very liberal on like poverty and these things, but he's always been kind of conservative on race. Take 20 seconds to talk to your partner. Why might he have been conservative on race early in his career? Go. Why? <laughs> All right, stop you guys there. Give me a what you think. Why would he be conservative on race?
Sure. Where's he from? Yeah, right? He's a white Southerner. Keep in mind that as he grows up, he's a white Southern Democrat. In the 1920s and 30s and 40s, are there white Southern Democrats who argue for civil rights? No. No. So, like, he's a product of his time, right? Uh, and, and it's important that we understand that he he's my favorite president to study, not my favorite president, because of this idea of transformation, that he can grow up in the South, be a white Southern Democrat, use the N-word, but then, okay, well, it's a product of his time. 20 years later, he is then the, the architect of the most important civil rights legislation in American history. So it goes to show that, that, that progress is possible by society as a whole and by individuals. White Southern Democrat, he's a phenomenal politician. He has what's called the LBJ treatments, in which he's a, he's a man's man. I'll play after school today a phone call of his that you're going to laugh your ass off at. It's hilarious. He's ordering pants on the phone. That's all I'll say. But he has what's called the LBJ treatment, in which he just gets up in people's faces like this. He puts his finger out, and he's like, so you're going to vote for this bill, right? Because if you don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know what we're going to have. And he's, he's intimidating. He's like 6'5". He's a big-ass dude. He has zero context of personal space. Sometimes he's in the Oval Office, the president's office, uh, and he, the reporters are in there. And he's like, cool, let's continue this conversation. Come with me. And he'll go and start taking shit with the reporters like in the room. <laughs> right? He doesn't care. He's a man's man. He's like, I got things to do. You want to continue this conversation? I got to take a dump right now. What's good? <laughs> So, so he's 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 a he's a rough Texas hill country dude, but he's 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 been in the Senate for a long time. He's phenomenal at building coalitions and getting things done. So he's the perfect president at this time, right? LBJ promises to continue Kennedy's liberal agenda, and he ends up far exceeding any president on liberal policies since FDR and arguably ever. Like uh, he, the Southern Democrat from Texas, ends up getting the more civil rights acts passed, more urban poverty acts passed, more stuff to help people done than any arguably any president ever. He pushes through the greatest array. Ah, oh, there it is. The greatest array of liberal legislation in U.S. history, surpassing FDR's New Deal, surpassing the Progressive Era, surpass, suppressing or excuse me, surpassing uh, Reconstruction. The greatest array of liberal legislation in U.S. history. Yes, sir. Why didn't Congress put back on the policy? Why what? Why didn't Congress put back? They they, they do back. short term, but keep in mind that like Kennedy's assassination builds sympathy. So people in government want to do something to honor what Kennedy stood for, because he just got shot in the back of the head. Make sense? A little bit. So like, and then he's gonna get reelected in '64 by a lot. He's gonna get his mandate election. And that then leads to things getting done. Good question, though. Good question, though. So his presidency, his policy is called the Great Society. Right, Kennedy was New Frontier. He's the Great Society. And with the Great Society, he's going to declare war on poverty. He grew up poor as hell in rural white America, Texas, uh, in a, in a tiny shack house with no electricity, no running water. He understands poverty, and he wants to address poverty. Uh, very important. Two amendments passed under his presidency, the 24th and the 25th. 24th is going to outlaw poll taxes. Interesting. The 25th is going to set up presidential succession. So uh, if the president dies and the vice president dies, like who comes next? So that whole idea ideology. Uh, but under his presidency, we really see the civil rights movement get their biggest successes. The counterculture movement begin, this, this hippie anti-society movement. Uh, and then we'll save his foreign policies for uh, Monday because they're a disaster. You know. So as soon as Kennedy dies, still during Kennedy's term, as JFK takes office, uh, he passes quickly uh, the two things that Kennedy was working on, right? Saying we should honor his legacy by do, by by approving what he stood for, a huge reduction in income taxes. That's not that big of a deal, but it increases spending and new jobs, so that's good for the economy. A huge a huge increase in in spending via income taxes. But the most important piece is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is arguably the biggest step 
But America's made on social progress since the 14th Amendment, which guarantees citizenship. Civil Rights Act of 64 is going to declare any segregation in any public facility illegal. You can't segregate anywhere that's a public facility. Parks, schools, water fountains, beaches, buses, whatever, you can't segregate. Big deal. And it's going to take steps to protect black voting rights. It's going to send people to the South to register African Americans to vote, to work on increasing black representation in politics. This is the most significant legislation on race of any kind since Reconstruction. Since Reconstruction. And after doing this, he still has to run for president. So we have to give LBJ a ton of props for doing this even though he's about to run for president. Is this not going to piss off a good chunk of America? Yeah. And he does it anyway. In 64, he runs for president on his own. He runs against Barry freaking Goldwater. Barry Goldwater, senator from Arizona, and he's going to argue that LBJ's liberal welfare programs are communism. Helping out poor people is communism. LBJ is too soft on communism. I will be tough on communism. He calls for an end to these welfare ideas of helping people and a stronger foreign policy. Right? He's out. Elect me president, I'll just nuke everybody. Call it a day. And of course, George Wallace runs for president again. Now, LBJ wins in a landslide. Take a look at it real quick. Ooh, oh my gosh. LBJ wins in a landslide, but it's not just that he wins. Democrats also take control of both houses of Congress. That's why. So the Democrats take control of the House and the Senate, and he wins a mandate election, and that's why we can get so much stuff done, just like the post-1932 with FDR. When all the, the party controls everything, they can push through kind of whatever they want. The Democrats are back in, in control of Congress, both houses, for the first time in 25 years. First time since the Truman uh, midterms of 48, which gave us the, 46, excuse me, which gave us the Taft Hartley Act and the like. So it's the first time the Democrats are in control of all three parts of, of the government since uh, the end of World War II. Let's go, look at it. So take a minute with your partner, answer that next question if you could. Uh, what is this demonstrated about American society and public opinion in 1964? And then think to yourself, what might come next? One minute, go. Dive in, dive in, have a quick conversation. Wow. What does this say about public opinion? It's important. Um, Wait, so are you ready for, for, for a good discussion right now? <laughs> Alright, tell me please, uh, Mr. Morales, my boy J-Mo. J-Mo. What does this say about public opinion? They, they like his policies. They like his policies. What kind of policies? They like welfare. His, yeah, his liberal po welfare policies, civil rights policies, absolutely. Is it fair to say the civil rights movement's attempt to change public opinion has worked? Yeah. Right? Uh, but look look who's voting red. Republican for the first time. I mean, also happened in 1960. Now we're, we're seeing a shift in political parties. All of a sudden, Republicans are, are all of a sudden, Southerners are voting Republican. Interesting. All it took was civil rights. Hmm. Interesting. Is the white rural South rich? Yes or no? Are they industrialized? Do they benefit from Republican type policies? Then why would they vote Republican? Interesting. I didn't say it. And yet, still, civil rights groups are not content. They realize, MLK argues like, look, you've done a lot, LBJ, but I need more from you. I need more. I, we need a Voting Rights Act. And LBJ says, I got you. I do. I got you. Let me finish this election first. So let me get this election. Let me get more control of the Democratic Party, and then we'll revisit voting rights. And he does. And he does. Uh, Freedom Summer happens during the election in 1964. Freedom Summer is incredibly important as thousands of college students, white and black, go to the South to help register thousands of Mississippis to vote. 
recipient to. Now we're sending people to the South, like during Reconstruction, to try to help these Mississippi black residents get through the registration process so that they can vote. We see the uh, leader of the Freedom Summer Movement get shot and killed outside of his house this summer by uh, angry members of the KKK who don't like the fact that white and black northerners are coming to the South to register black people to vote. He gets shot with a shotgun in front of his house. 1965 gives us the monumentally important protest march from Selma to Montgomery in Alabama. They try it once, and the police in Alabama on police horses stomp out protesters and kill a Catholic priest who was there to support them from Massachusetts. Of course, it is all covered by the news. It's called Bloody Sunday, as, as John Lewis is almost beaten to death, now in Congress, you just read about. Uh, and all of these, these black activists are just going to march peacefully across the state of Alabama, and they are put down violently by the police. Again, this shocks people in the North more than any other event. The news coverage is so important, guys, that people in their living rooms can see what's happening, and that causes people to really question what their country is all about. Keep in mind also, what's the U.S. doing globally at this point? What are we fighting? The Cold War. What are we, what are we trying to stop? Because communism. communism is not about democracy. freedom, democracy. So all of these other countries, the Soviet Union is making fun of us. They're like, oh yeah, you're fighting for freedom and democracy? Like, what's happening in Alabama? Uh, we're trying to tell other countries, like, stand with us because we stand with you for freedom. Other countries are like, but y'all heard about black people, right? So it's important to put this in its global context, as well as its domestic context of this rise in the party. I have another short clip to show you. I know, I know, it's a big day today. <laughs> Alright, we're going to talk about the Selma March and Bloody Sunday. So just watch it, it's a couple minutes long, four minutes long. Uh, it'll show you a little bit of the clips from the first time, Bloody Sunday, and then it'll show you how LBJ responds to guarantee their safety next time. Deal? Deal? You guys like the clips? <coughs> no, you go to the bathroom every time I'm tired of that shit. Go ahead. <laughs> I know it is. You're going to be okay. I'll let you go two minutes early. We can make it up there so you all get back in time to change. I need a shit. Huh? You got to do it in two minutes? Yeah. But when I worked at a restaurant, you think I could just leave all my tables and everybody have to take a shit? Exactly. So what do you do? Yeah. Suck it up, my man. Until your break comes. Your break's coming in 40 minutes. All right. Selma, Bloody Sunday. Please watch. It's good footage. The film was going to be more culmination of a long struggle for voting rights that triggered a national outcry. The thing he starts with is the Selma March is, is the culmination of a long process for voting rights. Right? Black people didn't just wake up one day like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to march. No. Right? They're, they're trying this. They're trying that. The freedom rights, the Birmingham bus boycott. Uh, the Freedom Summer registered people go, all these things lead up to a point in which they're trying to make a statement with a long march peacefully on voting rights. So keep in mind that it's a long scope. It's maybe some good footage too. Voting rights that a national outcry. A national outcry. The violence is just. Bloody Sunday, the
over you. Don't have to stop. You ready? Um, broad fruit. And if that's something that you go, it's time to do it. At this point, I'm very low in sixth grade. And you see a bunch of, have you ever paid attention? A bunch of younger white people participating. Do you guys see that? Yeah. That's, I want to point that out as part of what we consider the new left that you read about a little bit that's going to play a role going forward of this, this new young liberal group of like white college students who are super involved in anti-war protests, uh, equality and free speech on college campuses, and civil rights. So here they are in Selma, marching alongside African Americans, arguing for the same thing. Right? So it's important that this, this coalition is biracial. On sixth grade, we cleaned up at the campsite. I had to be part of the cleanup crew. They camped out overnight for four different nights. They had a crew that was just down the street, packed them up and moved them up to the next campsite. They had a crew that did the same thing with the kitchen, the food, the juice, and all that. As they're going, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a couple hundred mile march. All right, they're camping overnight, and they're and they're cleaning up after themselves. Like it seems, it seems trivial and simple, but even like this huge thousands of persons march, they have the African American community has crews set up to clean up their campsites behind them as they go to make sure they're leaving the place better than they found it. Like just little things that, in my opinion, make a huge difference. Also, what? Walk, <laughs> yep, walk, coon, <coughs> go home, scum, communists and MLK, and they're arguing for the state's rights. Isn't that the same thing the South argued for regarding slavery? Yes. Uh, it's, not, it's not the federal government's job to tell us, it's a state decision. And here we are making the exact same argument, but over the integration, and schools, and civil rights, and voting rights, and citizenship rights. This guy, obviously, in favor or against the march? Against. I'm pretty sure he's against it. Who's behind him? <laughs> yep. A U.S. Army troop. <laughs> because LBJ has guaranteed their safety after the first time went so badly on Bloody Sunday, that the next time they do this, they'll be protected by the federal government. Here the Army is doing exactly that. So now we have Eisenhower sent the military to Arkansas for schools. Kennedy sent the military to Alabama for schools, and LBJ sent the military to guarantee the safety of this march. Kind of cool. Feeling of 
So, the response to this, as you saw, is LBJ making an impassioned speech in Congress asking for voting rights. Now, I've never made you read a speech this long, so I'm not going to make you read a speech this long now. What I will do is have you read along while I play his speech. This is, in my opinion, and it is a humble opinion, the best document you'll read all year in English. Followed closely by the Gettysburg Address. But the best, so he makes this speech in Congress in the context of this march taking place, demanding that America do better, demanding that America rise to the challenge, and, and demanding that America give civil rights. But I'm going to ask you that you follow along on your notes so that you can get the textual analysis of it as well. See, he sounds like a redneck, but then he's talking like this. You can't judge everybody by their accent. You ready? And history and faith meet at a single time in a single place to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. So what is he comparing Selma to in the introduction? The end of the Civil War and the start of the Revolutionary War. So the two big events America's had that have been, been about humanity and citizenship and freedom, he's comparing their Selma March to that. And there, long-suffering men and women peacefully protested the denial of their rights as Americans. Many were brutally assaulted. One good man, a man of God, was killed. There is no cause for pride in what has happened in Selma. There is no cause for self-satisfaction in the long denial of equal rights of millions of Americans. But there is cause for hope and for faith in our democracy and what is happening here tonight. For the cries of pain and the hymns and protests of oppressed people have summoned into convocation all the majesty of this great government government of the greatest nation on earth. Our mission is at once the oldest and the most basic of this country. To right wrong, to do justice, to serve man. In our time we have come to live with the moments of great crisis. Our lives have been marked with debate about great issues. Issues of war and peace. Issues of prosperity and depression. So he's saying like, like our time, like our, you know, he's a 50-year-old man at this point. Our, his, our lives have been marked by crises. What crises is he referencing? Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War. He said, this is our next crisis. Just as important as solving the Great Depression, just as important as winning World War II is civil rights. But rarely in any time does an issue lay bare the secret heart of America itself. Rarely are we 
met with a challenge, not to our growth, our abundance, or our welfare, or our security, but rather to the values and the purposes and the meaning of our beloved nation. The issue of equal rights for American Negroes is such an issue. And should we defeat every enemy, and should we double our wealth and conquer the stars, and still be unequal to this issue, then we will have failed as a people and as a nation. For with a country as with a person, what is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world, his own soul. There is no Negro problem. There is no Southern problem. There is no Northern problem. There is only an American problem. I'm going to stop it there. Uh, what I'm going to encourage you to do, I'm going to have you right now, is I'm going to have you take two minutes just to skim as far further into the speech as you can. I don't need you to write anything. I don't need you to answer the questions in the column. I just need you to read it and get to the gist of what LBJ is arguing about American society and our task going forward. Okay, take two and get as far into it as you can. Go for it. Oh, right. Wherever you are, just turn, talk to your partner for 30 seconds, discuss why might Winchell think this is such a monumental and important speech. Go for it. Dive in. What did you take out of this? Oh, I like it. <coughs> 